Baltimore, Maryland, October 7th, 1849. He was still residing here when he died in Baltimore. He was doing a lecture tour and he was gathering funding for his future business venture, a literary magazine that he wanted to create called The Stylus of the Pen Magazine. Unfortunately, he never made it back. His death is a mystery. Nobody knows what happened to Edgar Allan Poe as people only kept medical records for a couple of years and then they'll discard them. So uh, there's a lot of theories out there. Some of them are strong, some of them are far-fetched. We'll talk a little bit about those. You pick the one that you like as we're moving along, all right? <laughs> uh, what's ironic about his death is he is the father of the modern detective story. Sir Conan A. Doyle, who created Sherlock Holmes, wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be a Sherlock Holmes without Edgar Allan Poe, as Edgar Allan Poe started that genre, the modern detective story. And the first detective was Auguste Dupin in Murders in the Rue Morgue, all right? So, and that was in the 1830s. Sherlock Holmes came to be in the 1890s, all the way to like 1920 before Conan and Doyle died. Uh, what's ironic is that he created such a genre, like the detective genre, and nobody knows how he died. <laughs> so there's your little irony really? for you, all right? Yep. It is interesting, all right? But if you think about it, I think you would have loved it this way. And in true, true uh, detective form, or, in tr or being true to the genre, this is a cold case for 170 years for any detective to finally solve. So it adds to his legacy that nobody knows how he died. I think he would have loved it this way. All right? mm -hmm. so, and then we'll talk about some of those uh, theories later on. Now, when Edgar Allan Poe moved in here, for one major reason, to try to save his wife's life. He knew it was a vain attempt. Biological mother, foster mother, and brother died of tuberculosis. Now, wife is dying of tuberculosis. If you read The Mask of the Red Death, the Red Death is tuberculosis. He talks a lot about blood. One of the side effects is you cough up blood. So he knew what was coming. He was all too familiar, but he still needed to try. He loved her very much. So from downtown from Manhattan, he moved to Westchester County. This wasn't called the Bronx. This was called Westchester County, of course. Some of you are from Westchester County, nice north of us. Huge county. Just imagine a whole 40 square miles worth of Bronx added to Westchester County in the 1800s. Uh, scattered farmlands, very few towns were established at this point. And just to give you an idea, when he moved here in 1846, the majority of Manhattan was still country. 42nd Street around that time was your cutoff point. So everything north of 42nd Street was country. So the city was very, very small, all right, 13 miles away from this location. Um, and he moved to this particular section. This particular section was called Fordham Village. Two taverns, a hotel, and a blacksmith, and cottages like this were all too common around this area. And he paid a local farmer, John Valentine, a whopping $100 the entire year, which equates, of course, to $3,100, $3,200. And he did that three years straight, so he rented, he did not own. We also have a Valentine Avenue across the street. Same family that rented the house to Edgar Allan Poe. All of this was Valentine farmland. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Virginia, uh, she succumbed to the disease within five, uh, uh, six months of moving in here, unfortunately, after a five long year battle. She was already in her last stages, a devastated Poe, loved her very much, 13 year marriage, she was only 26 years old. She married young, she died young, all right? He died when he was 40, which is young, she died when she was 26 years old, all right? But uh, Edgar Allan Poe still moved on, still stood here for another two years and a half. He was already famous for the Raven, which occurred a year prior, 1845, downtown Manhattan, but when he moved here, he did a lot of great pieces, just to name a few. Annabelle Lee, The Cask of Montiato, The Bells, Eureka, Landor's Cottage, Jululu, Mula Lee. He did a lot of great pieces, but as you can see, very, very poor. He actually needed to supplement his income, and he did that by doing reviews and critiques, newspapers and magazines, but it was a struggle to heat up the home, put food on the table. He's accredited with being the first American literary to solely live off of his writing alone. Other literaries that needed to supplement their incomes did something away from literature. He did it with writing alone. <laughs> now, these are all period pieces, but we still have three original pieces in the other rooms. Gives you an idea of what he owned in the cottage or in this particular room, the, the kitchen, a couple of Ornamental plates, Dutch plates, a couple of chairs, small table, and the cast iron stove. That is it. Now, when the house was built in 1812, we would have been using the fireplace. You cook your food, you heat up your home, but by the time my grandpa moved in here, already blocked off with a fireboard to prevent the heat from escaping, and he was known to have the cast iron stove, which is a dual purpose. You could also heat up your home as well, and it's much more efficient. And grandpa was strapped for cash. He would appreciate having a cast iron stove, save them a couple of bucks with, fuel, uh, with your fuel source. Most of the heat, through the chimney goes through the through the when the fireplace goes through the chimney anyway. You need much more material just to keep the fire going. All right. Uh, by the 1830s, they started to phase out the fireplaces in the kitchen. Um, the cast iron stove was invented, and uh, the second um, the second cause of death for a woman was the fireplace. First childbearing, oh then the fireplace. Long dresses, no oh. fire retardant clothing, little ember, and you light up. All right. So by this time, they started to phase them out. All right. 
Wow. Right here, fuel source, wood, coal, dry straw, dry hay, of course, it is my excess of merchandising. Home <laughs> to hand tin cans and quills and things like that. But right here would have been fuel sources, right here. Antique foot warmer, you take a piece of coal, you put it on this container, you close the flap, <clears throat> put it in here, close the flap, and you have warm feet on the top, all right? It's perforated, uh, it's perforated on the top, so. I wouldn't try it. <laughs> Metal is a great conductor of heat. Imagine that the top being super hot. I wouldn't yeah. try it, but yeah, you may do what you got, right? All right. So, water bucket. No running water then or now, but they had a water spring part of the Valentine property, two blocks north. They could go get their water as much as they wanted to. No bathroom. They had it down house a couple of years ago. Let's go into the living room. You, sir, watch your head. All right. I'm just saying. All right. Every time you go to another room, just watch your head. All right. <laughs> Now, you are in, the, of course, the living room, or the parlor room, as they used to call it. This is where people would spend most of the time in the 1800s in this particular room, right? We have three original pieces, two are in this room, which is the rocking chair. The rocking chair is previously owned by Poe, and uh, jokingly. Just like this was country at one point, the rocking chair was modern at one point, and it was considered to be his most modern piece of furniture that he owned was the rocking chair. <laughs> All right? There you go. <laughs> Just let it rock. Hey, you want to hear a joke? When people come in sometimes and I'm alone, I rock the chair, and then I open the door. All right? So I'm just, I'm just joking. All right? Now, um, the living room mirror was also his, all right? The living room mirror was considered to be his most expensive piece. Now, simply put, it couldn't be manufactured. Anything that takes time that's handcrafted usually costs a lot more money. Once you can put it on the production line and you can crank out a couple of these uh, in an hour, that's when the, uh, the price starts to drop, all right? But this is his most ex uh, expensive piece and it was a gilded edge mirror, all right? And then we have a third piece in the other room that we'll talk about later on. All right, let's talk about the house for a moment. The house is over 200 years old. It's a city and federal landmark built in 1812 by a man named John Wheeler, but it's only been on this location 104 years. It was actually moved in 1913. Across the street, down the block, about a block and a half away, Kingsbridge and Sedgwick, and roughly around that area is where the cottage used to stand. But it was in serious danger of being demolished in its original location. Number one, um, property values started to soar. We are the last borough added to New York City, so that transition from, from country to city really started to happen in the late 1800s. You start to see the first tenement buildings. So as you see the new buildings, they started demolishing all these houses, all right, number one. Number two, the Kingsbridge Road itself, that winds down to your right, was very narrow. If they would have widened the road and the cottage stood in its original position, it would have to be demolished as well. So two major factors in moving the house over here. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, I got it, don't worry about it. So take your time, take some pictures until your battery runs out, I'll be back in a minute or so, all right? <laughs> all right. Hello. It's, it's great, you gotta watch it. The Amish are the best of doing it, all right? They have that old school living, so they know how to build a wooden home, they also know how to move a wooden home as well, so they're pretty dope. Um, so, 29 year battle, 1884, but the house wasn't moved until 1913. You know, it's the city. They take their sweet, sweet time, all right? And uh, it was Edgar Allan Poe's last three years of his life that saved this house. And because Edgar Allan Poe lived here, this is the last remaining structure of Fordham Village. Nothing else exists but this structure, all right? That's and cool. he was already so famous and popular that at that point? Uh, no, he was more famous as an editor when he died. Uh -huh. He was famous as a writer locally. Uh -huh. Baltimore, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and New York City because he frequently went there. He lived there more than once, and even when he was not living there, he would go talk to friends, family, conduct some business, and things like that. His writing fame came about 15, 20 years down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, that's why they wanted to preserve the house like, right. at that point. Right, no, at this point in 1884, when the campaign started, he was a sensation around the world, right? Okay. But he died in 1849, so, uh -huh. you know, this is 30 plus years down the line. Mm. All right, and the house in Richmond, Virginia, they actually t torn it down, and then they come to realize 20 years down the line, ah, people <laughs> made a mistake. <laughs> All right, so they rebuilt those, uh, the, the house in Richmond, Virginia, they built it to the exact same dimensions, and somehow, some way, they're gonna tell me that they used the same stones, like uh -huh. a couple of decades later. 
<laughs> door handles, hey, whatever makes them good. All right? But um, no, but um, yeah, uh, that's the familiar symptoms of living in the 1800s, especially for the uh, something that you do that's created. It's amazing. Right here, you could be mildly famous and make a ton of money. Over there, if you were a theater actor or writer, if you were, uh, if you painted, you'd be surprised. None of them really got famous, all right? They really lived a poor life. Mm. Poor Van Gogh only sold one painting. I mean, come on, that was in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. all right? But um, yeah, so that's 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 um, that's it. that's what it is. But anyway, the last remaining structure of Ford furniture, right? Let me see if they're gonna turn it off. Yeah, that's that's bad right there. That's not that the presentation over does that. Um, so yeah, so his last few years of his life saved the house, all right? And nobody saved poor man's home on top of that. It's usually beautiful, luxurious, great furniture, or there's a long, long history. Like grandpa was a politician, the son is a politician, the, the grandchild is a politician. They all happen to sleep in the same crib. You know, <laughs> they use the same furniture. There's nothing luxurious about this home. This is a poor man's home, and there's only a few examples of this style of home throughout the United States, okay? Now, 1902, the park was created in its name, and it's called Pope Park, and when did the house was not going to survive across the street, they allocated a section of the land for the eventual move of the cottage, all right? Now, the bust, 1909, for his 100-year anniversary of his birth, the bust was actually unveiled in the south end of the park in a granite pedestal. During the 1940s, they brought him in for the preservation and fear of theft. His name is Edwin T. Quinn, and his cast in bronze, all right? One of the reasons why it was brought in is it looks like 100 pounds, but in reality, it's hollow. It's like 25 pounds. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it, it looks incredibly heavy, but... All right, so anybody with a little determination could have taken it. All right, so it was brought in uh, and it's been on this mahogany pedestal ever since. All right, did you enjoy it? Hi. Did you enjoy it? Thank you very much. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a nice, it's a pleasure, my oh, friend. All right, all right, all right, let me, give me one second. Let me open the door for the gentleman. You don't want to stay a little bit longer? Yeah. Uh, to this frame right here. That is the Brooklyn Museum, 1959, for its 150-year anniversary of his birth. Now, he invented the goth, right? So he's considered the king of the the father of the detective story. He added to science fiction, all right? Believe it or not, he wrote an essay called The Philosophy of Furniture. And he put so much detail in talking about his ideal room and certain pieces of furniture that we should all own, they made an exhibit in 1959, all right? And he was just talking about his ideal room to work in and to relax in. There's a hanging bookshelf in the photograph. We also have a hanging bookshelf on the right-hand side of, your, of the room. And we knew he had a writing desk in the living room, but the particular style, we also got it from the philosophy of furniture. He described the writing desk that has many different compartments that folds, that have detachable legs, all right? He even has handles on the side for easy transport. So these are two practical pieces of furniture. So even the hanging bookshelf, you can throw it on your back and you can go wherever you have to go. And Edgar Allan Poe did travel a lot. They never spent more than a year and a half in a particular city. So it's amazing they actually stood in this house the last few years of his life. That's why there's so many Poe houses. And believe me, everybody loves Poe. Poe could have coughed on this piece of wood. They would put a plaque on it, just <laughs> all right? And they got a couple of things in uh, Boston, so he was born there, a statue, a couple of plaques, and all of, throughout the East Coast. And even the Scottish claim a little bit of him because the adopted family, the Allen family of Scottish descent. The British claim a little bit of him because his mother, Eliza Poe, is of British descent. And then the Irish claim a little bit of him because David Poe, his biological father, is of Irish descent, all right? So everybody claims a little bit of Poe. All right, so philosophy of furniture, 1959, 150-year anniversary of his birth. Right here, a romanticized version of the cottage. This, this is the same cottage. It's a watercolor action by Gustav Mercier, 1880s. This is the bucolic, the beautiful, the version that we want to be there, all right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there is no uh, Poe art without a Poe identifier, like a raven perched and flying, of course, <laughs> all right? And uh, this is the beautiful we want to be there version, but between the two gentlemen over here. That is the complete opposite. It is dark, it is spooky, it is muted colors. It's a November evening on a windswept storm with ravens flying all around. The version that we do not want to be in, all right? Mm -hmm. um, whenever you get the chance, you know, get really, really close, almost, almost kissing the etching. It's going to drown out all the reflection, but there's a lot of detail in the etching. And we have three original pieces. This is my favorite one. All right. It just screams out Poe. All right. Before we go, the hanging bookshelf have uh, books of uh, from the 19th century, 
mid to late 1800s of things that you could have possibly read based on his works like French Revolution, Criminal Law, European History, History of the Monarchies, things like that. And then we have a beautiful painting above the reign that's of Edgar Poe. The one thing that you will notice about Poe, uh, especially looking at his Vigero types, he looks bad. He looks unhealthy. He does not look good at all, all right? And um, photography in its infancy, even if he wanted to smile, they didn't recommend it, because if you would smile, you'd have to hold that smile. And it went from two to 10 minutes, depending on your camera equipment. So you just look crazy, number one. Number two, he was so poor, he was the shuffle, he would wear the same clothing all the time. And uh, like I said, unhealthy. So the painters and the sketch artists from around the world, they do them that favor. So they always idealize them, even subconsciously, without them, know, them knowing about it. They just give them health, they give them a smile from time to time, unless they shuffle those like the poor we want to do. All right, and then I'm gonna show you his most famous picture, which oddly enough is the picture that he looks the worst in. All right, <laughs> so please come on in. All right, to the next room for the tall folks, just watch your head. You, you watch your head, all right, all right, just in case, all right. The same, almost the same story from my previous docent from like five years ago. Some guy told me, get out of Virginia's room. I want to start doing a seance by myself. Sit right here in the room. And I looked at him. I'm like, you're going to get up in two minutes or the cops will get you up in two minutes. Okay? <laughs> so don't, don't come out there. He got up. He's like, oh, no, but this is perfect. I'm like, no, you don't tell me to get out. Okay? <laughs> I'm not going to allow you to be here in Virginia's deathbed, which is the delicate bed. All right. This is the reason why we have like some like a uh, this uh, door in half because this is the most delicate piece. So we want people to see it, but we don't want people to be in here. Uh -huh. So he told me to get out. I said, get out of here with that, man. No, no, characters all the time, and that's the latest one. All right. We're not gonna we're not gonna go with that. All right. So, in true Poe fashion, I will narrate. All right. You will be hearing my voice. Okay. So, this is the room where Virginia died. The bed is the third piece. That is Virginia's death bed. And she lasted only six months in the cottage, but only a couple of weeks in this particular room. And the reason for that is they slept upstairs in the master bedroom together. But from time to time, they got to pull physically, we'll have to pick up his wife to go up and down those stairs. So tuberculosis was just sapping all her energy. So at one point, moved her in here. just easier for her to go about her daily activities, get your water, just stuff like your fresh country air. That's the original door over there. So it's only a couple of paces away to the front porch to get that fresh country air, as that's the main reason why they moved over here. A couple of weeks here, six months in the cottage, battling tuberculosis five long years. She was diagnosed 1842. She died January 1847. 13-year marriage, she was only 26 years old. All right. Now, right behind the gentleman, this is the high bridge, the, the frame on your left hand side. The high bridge is very important. The high bridge is the oldest bridge in the city. Don't get confused with that Brooklyn Bridge, all right? The Brooklyn Bridge is the second oldest bridge. Now, if you want to get super technical, it's the oldest vehicular bridge in the city. But the high bridge was built in 1848. It used to be an aqueduct, fresh water from the Curtin River, past the Bronx into Manhattan. Expanded their capabilities in the 1880s. Ceased to be an aqueduct in the 1940s. The aqueduct system still works. Um, when, the aqueduct, when the aqueduct system was created, it was the highest engineering feat in the world because they took a page from the Romans from 40 miles away. They used gravity just to bring water into Manhattan. So it was pretty cool. Uh, but in 1970, officially closed because of the high crime rate in the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. If you haven't heard the term, the Bronx is burning, just Google that and yeah, be amazed uh, how the Bronx used to look. But now, we're super safe, of Manhattan is super safe, and since June of 2015, after 46 years of being closed, they reopened that. But more importantly, yeah. since you're here, Edgar Allan Poe walked on that bridge the last two years of his life. Yeah. So if you want to get nostalgic without doing too much, just walk on the high bridge. That's all you got to do. Uh, right. Sorry, where did you say it is? It's at 170th Street and Aqueduct Avenue. It's about three miles away. So if you're taking a train, both trains, the old before, 170th Street, and just walk to the west side. And when you get off the bridge, you'll be in the Washington Heights section of the oh, Bronx. Okay. But when you get out, you actually will be in High Bridge Park. If you like to do more cultural things, south end of the park, 
the Morris Jumel Mansion, North End, the Light Tower, the that's made out of red brick. Uh -huh. That's also a historic landmark. So uh -huh. there's nice. things to do about it, all right? What mansion? Uh, the the Morris Jumel Mansion. Uh -huh. All right, it's very very cool. It's a self guided tour, so uh -huh. it's pretty nice. So uh -huh. just go over there with fresh batteries, all right, and just click uh -huh. away, all right. <laughs> so. Uh, that's Jacob Rosa Mayer, and uh, when you do take that walk, notice not a single building in the background. When you take that walk, you're going to see a lot of buildings in the um, background, all right? Mm -hmm. So the middle newspaper clipping, that is uh, a, a newspaper clipping. That is Edgar Allan Poe trying to get in here, all right? Do not acknowledge him. He will haunt you for the rest of your life, all right? Give me a second. Oh, hi. See, this is what I like to say. Series out there, but the, the real, there's three strong theories in my opinion. Now they got books on his death alone so you can investigate it by yourself. I'm just using my logical thinking, all right? So don't take me as an investigator. I'm very amateurish, all right? So political victim is one of those strong theories. Why? Uh, it was a common practice back in those days and not just Maryland, you know, New York State, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, historically has been done and will continue to do so. Uh, what these shady politicians will do is they'll offer you three things, money, drugs, or alcohol, or they'll sneak it in your drinks, all right? Make you uh, 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 easily manipulated and make you a repeated voter. The term is called pooping. Vote, change your appearance, vote, change your appearance, and you turn on the voting booth through the process all over again. When he was found, laid down semi-conscious in the streets of Baltimore in other people's clothing, he soiled himself. He was a block away from a polling booth, and on that day there was election day. Mm -hmm. All right, and it's a common practice. And then, you know, in Chicago in the early 1900s, vote early and vote often. That was their saying. All right, uh, Arizona, uh, three four years ago, they caught a lot of people voting more than 3,000 times electronically. And as far as a couple of months ago, uh, there were more than 3,000 Hillary supporters that weren't even uh, citizens. They were illegal immigrants. So it will continue to do so and it will, you know, it will continue to go on, all right? So, In Illinois, the dead vote, so yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I heard that as well, all right? They will take names from graveyards and they'll put them in the poll as well. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. So the dead vote, you know, so that's okay, you know? So I guess it's uh, death, taxes, and voting. Those are the three things, all right? Not all right. So that's one. Number two, uh, rabies. He exhibited all the familiar symptoms of having rabies, all right? He wasn't dead when they found him. He lasted four days in Washington Hospital, but he didn't know how he got there. Coming in and out of consciousness. Asking for Virginia. Virginia's already dead for two years and a half. Talking to spirits on the wall. High fever throughout those four days. Died in a delirium. Familiar symptom of having rabies. And then the third one, the literary world can take it no more, all right? So they exhumed his body in 1997, they tested his bones, they find high levels of arsenic, all right? Now arsenic is a poison, but it used to be good for you in the 1800s, all right? If you were sick, here's an arsenic tonic for the ladies out there all over your makeup, all right? Because he gave you a pale look because that means that you were a woman of the house. You did not look, all right? That gave you higher status, all right? Green paint wallpaper used to uh, put arsenic on it, so whenever it got humid, you'll be breathing it in. And then any clothing that had green patterns, you'll be absorbing it through your, uh, through your skin. So he was probably poisoning himself without knowing that it was poisoning. Uh, readily available in all your pharmacies right next to mercury and opium. Uh, but yeah, weird. All right? Weird, the 1800s. Now, far-fetched theories. Alcohol poisoning, drug overdose, literary rival killing him, cancer, tumor, diabetes. You know, the $2,000 guy being dead, and the list goes on and on and on. All right, so nobody is supposed to know. It opens up a conversation, all right? And then this right here, literally, his most famous picture. You Google his name, you pick up a book. That is a picture you're going to see. Ultima Thule, Matthew Brady's The Ghetto Type, taken in 1848, Providence, Rhode Island. All right, he is only 39 years of age in that photograph, all right? He does not look good. He looks unhealthy, all right? And, um, that is the go-to picture whenever they want to idealize it. Matthew Brady did something revolutionary. He brought camera equipment into the battlefield for the first time, all right? And he had a team, all right? And that's why that particular half is famous because Abraham Lincoln took the, I mean, Matthew Brady took the presidential candidate's picture, Abraham Lincoln, and because of that, they think that he got Abraham Lincoln elected, so they kind of call him the father of public relations, all right? How dope is that, all right? So you got these two giants of men that got together, nobody cared, nobody cared. Now, everybody cares, all right? So let's go upstairs, stick to your left-hand side. Don't stray too far from your left or the right. Once you get up there, there's a sloping ceiling, all right? All right.
So, all right, my group is a witness. So imagine bringing your husband or your wife up and down these stairs. Now you know why she was kept downstairs, all right? <laughs> there you go. So, um, you can roam around after the presentation. I'm just going to give you a quick gist of this. This is the uh, study room. And it was known to have a study room right next to the master bedroom and also a writing desk downstairs. So depending on what it's doing, some of his works here, some of his works downstairs. And there is an exhibit based off the Matthew Brady the Ghetto type, as that's the go to. So the exhibit is based, all those spaces are based off the Matthew Brady the Ghetto type. And then we have a beautiful painting. Uh, Bronx resident, senior citizen, and armed forces veteran donated in 1991. His name is Kim. He's, uh, you know, he serves the, the, the armed forces and he's a master painter. So that's. That's pretty good. <laughs> a jack of all trades. Now, the important stuff. That frame right behind the gentleman. That one right there. That is the memorial. The memorial is where people pretty much congregate the most of our Pope fans. This is in Westminster Church, well, Westminster Cemetery. And his remains are actually in the catacombs of Westminster Church located inside Westminster Cemetery. Uh, but people congregate here the most. On January, uh, there was a tradition since 1950. The Poe toaster will come in here, give three red roses and some liqueur for Mr. Poe every January. All right, and it ceased to exist on 2009, which leads us to believe that this uh, soul has passed on. Even though there is somebody in his 90s that said that he was the Poe toaster, and it was a son-father combo. So when the father stopped, the son picked it up. But uh, I don't believe it. But you know, it's okay. But um, it was one of those things that really attracted people to the memorial. Also, Baltimore is synonymous with Edgar Allan Poe because he also has the, the home. But the memorial and the home is only a 10-minute drive between, between each other. So it's kind of like the mecca for the Pope fans. You get to do two things in 10, 15-minute drive, all right? Um, they're super proud. If you ever wonder why they call their football team the Baltimore Ravens, that's the reason why, all right? So uh, they named their multi-billion dollar team after one of his works. That's how you know they're super proud that he called Baltimore his home. And I often joke, if you talk to somebody from Baltimore, you could have sworn he was born there, he lived there, he did all his great works there, he married there, he died there, he did everything there. That's not the truth. <laughs> he was born in Boston, he was raised in, raised in Richmond, Virginia, and then by age 17 he started to really travel all over the East Coast because he was like a George Washington. Oh, George Washington stood here. Wow, that's fantastic. And then he stood over there, and then he stood, ah, he was all over the place, all right? 